do you have many non-Jewish friends? Mostly rabbis. Yeah, most of my friends are rabbis. Not a huge number. Me? Yeah, well, hopefully <laughs> we'll still be on good terms by the end of the week. I'm Stacey Dooley. Hi, Stacey! And I'm packing my bags for some more sleepovers. I'll be coming out of my comfort zone. Imagine if I fall to my death in Scotland. To spend the weekend in the homes of Britain's more extraordinary families. You lead! <laughs> I follow. You've likened feminism to cancer. <laughs> This is Hebrew. Oh, my goodness. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Imagine owning an island. Do you worry about having a criminal record? <laughs> <laughs> my name is Stacy. Ready, go. What's the best thing about being a model? No money. <laughs> Pumas yeah, don't belong no. in the UK. No. Oh my god! I really didn't anticipate this. Right now, I am en route to go and meet an Orthodox Jewish family. I think they're in the suburbs. Uh, it's outside North East London. So I do think it's really important to have conversations because I feel like there are so many lazy stereotypes, particularly over the last couple of years, like anti-Semitism is undeniably an issue. There are over a quarter of a million Jewish people living in the UK with varying levels of religious observance. Around 15% are strictly orthodox. They practice ancient traditions and complex rules with the kind of discipline I can only dream of. Of course, I've got Jewish friends, but they're much less traditional. With Orthodox Jewish families and communities, it feels so private. They have a very conservative, very traditional set of guidelines that they have to follow. And that does beg the question, do you have to sacrifice being a part of modern Britain? The father of the Wallenberg family is a rabbi, so they are provided with a six-bedroom house within a synagogue complex. Is this their house, this one? It's big. I'm off. I'm out of here. Hello. Hello, it's Stacy. Hi, come in. Thank you. Hey. Okay, I'll come and let you in. It sometimes works. Push now. Right, oh, there we're good. We go. we're good. That's good. Right, do come Thank in. Thank you so much. Mordecai, right. I'm Stacey. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Hello, Poppet. <laughs> you probably already know that we're the proud non-owners of a TV set, but we have heard of you. No, but you're not, you're not missing much. You really aren't. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Belima? Yeah. I'm Stacey. Hi. So nice Hi. to meet you. You don't have to take your shoes off. Whatever you prefer. You just have lots of shoes. Um, I'm going to be, hope not rude and not extend my hand to you because we have very strict boundaries. OK. So um, you don't touch anyone opposite gender. Got you. And you're, you're the rabbi. I am. So you look after this synagogue so next door? We, yes, uh, we are based in the synagogue next door. So we have services daily and on Shabbat on Saturday morning. It's quite a big time of the week and various Jewish holidays. And you've got nine. Children? Yes. I mean, I imagine it's completely non-stop. Some of it is um, non-stop because of all the kids. Some of it is non-stop because of our job. Um, some of it is non-stop because of being Orthodox Jewish and all the festivals that we've got through the year. Wow. So, yeah. I've never stayed in an Orthodox Jewish home before. Right. So it's a new for me, it's first. I hope it'll be quite an experience. Um, we're probably not typical because we sort of straddle different worlds because we're, we're obviously very orthodox, but we're also part of a community which is very diverse. Um, and we're not living in a sort of very orthodox Jewish neighborhood. So we get the best of all worlds, hopefully. Very excited. Shall we show you where you're staying? I'd love that, yeah. Have a look Thank around. You so much. Yes. Your house is massive. Lots of books. Lots of books. Lots of books. 
Within an impressively packed reading room is their most sacred book of all. Am I allowed to touch this? Yeah, yeah. The Torah, or Jewish Bible. Oh, brilliant. That side's all Hebrew. This is Hebrew, and it will oh be read. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I cannot. <laughs> At least it's not the real Torah. If you drop the real thing, I don't want everyone know. in the room would have to fast. Brilliant. <laughs> Can we not tell so anyone that I nearly dropped the, the Torah? I've no, been here. It's just the book. Ten it's minutes. Just the coffee. <laughs> I'm going to put this down. <laughs> With great care. This is the girls' room oh. and the baby's room. You could probably tell from the colours. How many girls you got? Two. Two girls. Two girls. And seven boys. Yes. This is the little boys' room. Can we see your room? Do you want to say hi? Do you want to say hi with mummy? Hello, Papa. This is Maishi. Maishi. Yeah. How old are you, Maishi? Three. 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 So, this is the room you're staying in. Look at this, very and fancy. I've lucked out. It's got a bathroom and oh, some puzzle pieces. You've got balcony. the memo. I can't, I can't possibly stay anywhere without a beautiful balcony. <laughs> <laughs> Most of your kids are at school. Yes. What time are they due back? They get back between 5 and 5.30. OK. How do they feel about me being here? Um, not sure. Mixed. So some of my kids don't like having pictures taken at all or videos, so they're obviously more shy. Hello. Hello, mate. How are you? Good. I'm Stacy. Hello. What's your name? Ysrolik. Ysrolik. How was school? What were you doing? Uh, I did art, uh, English, math, science. The usual. Yeah. Ooh. The whole gang, look, they're coming back. Hello! <laughs> Hi! <laughs> I seem to have found myself a guide with 13 year old Yisrolik. Okay, so you tell me who's who. This is Diddles. Diddles. She is eight. This is Yossi. Yep. Etel. Etel. Who is 12. Mm hmm. Done bat mitzvah a week ago. This is Mendel. Okay. Mendel, Yossi, Diddles, Ethel. Ethel. I'm a genius. This is Gabriel. Yeah. He's the youngest. Uh huh. His full name is Gabriel Naya, which is named after a rabbi who was killed in a attack in Mumbai 12 years ago. And it's like a custom that people name a son. Um, after him because he was a rabbi and he was killed in an attack. Wow. The last few years have seen fatal terror attacks on synagogues around the world. And anti-Semitic incidents in the UK have hit an all-time high. Wow. I mean, yeah, this is pretty sophisticated CCTV. I suppose you're at home so much and synagogues have been targeted recently does that play in the back of your mind you've got all your babies here your nine children um if i see a car stop outside i'll stop and look you know see who it is unfortunately there is a lot of anti-semitism around it's something we live with we're used to you know it's there in the back of your mind but we it, you can't focus on it unlike the majority of jewish people in britain the strictly orthodox rarely mix with anyone outside of their tight community. Opening their doors to outsiders feels extremely unusual. Why have you agreed to have us in your home this weekend? What are you hoping to achieve? When you're part of any minority group, rightly or wrongly, the fact is people judge very quickly. And that's just a reality. We all make assumptions about people. Mm. Um, often it's out of ignorance. Mm. Um, so, yeah, if there are any stereotypes out there or assumptions that people are making, hopefully, you know, we've got nothing to hide. We can show you, you know, why we do what we do or why we act the way or dress the way we dress. And hopefully that, you know, might be less intimidating mm. for people. Um, I guess people are just curious because yeah. some people feel like Orthodox Jewish families are very insular. So then you have loads of questions, but you don't get you don't get the opportunity to interact or to hang out, to spend time together. British society is it's not proper to ask people personal questions. Why not? You know, within reason. You know, if I see someone on a bus and you say, "Excuse me, I notice you've got the strings. Do you mind my asking you what they're for?" 
I'm not offended by that, but it's not a very British thing to do. Yeah. So sometimes I wonder if it's just like, oh no, we could never ask them, you know. Yeah. Um, do you have many non-Jewish friends? Um, not a huge number. Me? Um, yeah, well, hopefully. <laughs> um, Mostly rabbis. Yeah, most of my friends are rabbis. <laughs> Yisraelik Atul Mandel Diddles Supper. Hello, are you ready for supper? Where's your knife and fork? It's my first meal with the family. Keeping kosher means food must be both prepared and consumed under strict guidelines as commanded in the Torah. Because we separate milky and meaty, which we call milk and fleshy, when we have a milk at supper like this, which we can't put meat in because then it would be mixing. Then we have milky plates, milky forks. Everything is milky. Wow. So it doesn't work to just cook foods that are kosher. Yeah. Um, it's much more complex than that. Remind me why it's forbidden to mix milk and meat. There are some commandments which we just don't understand, and I think it's one of those. So it's just something that we don't understand we do because we're told to do. Well, the reason is because it says in the Bible not to do it, but it's not one that has a logical reason. It's like not murdering has a logical reason. Is that blind faith, though, if there's no logic behind it? So those particular commandments are very much about just doing it because God told you to. But I think faith is, in a way, blind faith, always. Because faith isn't... It is that you believe. And there's yeah. not necessarily a basis for that belief. Does that make sense? Yeah. Whatever faith is essentially a blind faith because mm. you believe. There's just a lot to try and get your head around. There's so much information. There's so much to take into consideration. So many traditions, so many rules, so many cultural differences. This is a world I am so unfamiliar with. <laughs> it's a very strict way of living. And I think that's where I don't subscribe to religion because I have a tricky time just accepting I'd have to adhere to things that I don't understand. It's Friday, and a special day of the week for many Jewish families. The children will only attend school for a few hours before returning to prepare for Shabbat, the holy day of rest. This gives me a chance to get to know a bit more about the parents and their unusual sleeping habits. Normally we don't, I don't like guests in my room. <laughs> First impressions. It's two beds. Yes. Which one's yours? Which one's Mordecai's? And why do you have two separate beds? So, the big one's mine. When a married Orthodox Jewish woman has her period, then a husband and wife won't um, have any physical contact. Um, so we have separate beds during that time and for a week afterwards. So about 12, 13 days. For those 12 days, when you're on your period, etc. He can't even touch you, let alone, I mean, having sex is completely forbidden, but you can't even sort of touch one another. Um, so they say absence makes the heart grow fonder, and it's definitely something that you, you can feel. Um, I suppose it works quite well if you've had a row. You know? <laughs> Sometimes, but obviously, you know, we have the one bed, and if you've kicked off or you've got the arm, um, someone gets sent to the sofa, so I suppose this lends itself <laughs> to that. There's clearly some quirks to orthodox married life. These are incredible. Look. I'm curious how things went down before they tied the knot. So um, when did you meet? Yeah, the, I guess the crucial question which shocks a lot of people is that we knew each other for about 11 days. So they do call it dating in our rabbi circles. And the difference being there's no physical contact. And also the, the whole purpose of going out is with a view to getting married, which is quite heavy, obviously. So before you're introduced, someone will do their homework, usually the parents, and make sure it's the type of person you 
want to marry um, you've got similar goals similar ideals um, so they'll make sure it's sort of compatible on paper so it was an arranged marriage not an arranged not really. marriage because you it's, it's like, an arranged it's like a blind date. Ma yeah kind of like a blind date so you go out you date but for the purpose of seeing if you're compatible if you've got chemistry we were both the third person that we went out with really? so it wasn't like first you know the first person you went out with and that was it an arranged marriage type of thing you have the decision uh, tell me what was on your wish list what was non-negotiable for you non-smoking that much i remember um i wanted to go out and work in a community um not russia that was like my red line i didn't think i could do russia dayton's like a minefield at the best of times yes. So when I you... don't know how people manage. At least we have kind of a framework of, like, there are certain things you know are going to happen, aren't going to happen. I, I don't know how people manage, like, no. <laughs> in the wider society where they've got much bigger questions to deal with, like, are we going to move in together or are we going to consummate our relationship? Well, I don't know, whatever. Um, I would hope that the message that our children are getting will be one of, it, you, you don't date for pleasure, you date because you're serious about finding someone within quite strict boundaries, and you're looking for someone that's similar to you that's going to lead a religious life and has the same values. Would the spouse have to be Jewish, Orthodox Jewish? Uh, that's baseline already. I mean, mm, like, yes. uh, you've seen how much detail there is in our lives. You know, can you imagine if somebody said, well, you know, I'm happy to marry you. You will do your religious stuff and I'll just, you know, stay out of it. And, you know, you can go to shul three times a day and eat strictly kosher and all this. And I'll go to church on Sundays. Well, how on earth is that going to work mm. practically? You need to really be mm. on the same page. With the kids home, the whole family must now do their bit before the sun goes down and the strict Shabbat restrictions begin. Quick lunch, please, because we've got lots to do still. Hey, Edsel Talk me through what happens in preparation for Shabbat. On Shabbat, we can't cook, use electricity, tear things, cut things. So in order to get ready, we do all our cooking in advance and the house is cleaned. Everyone takes showers, gets dressed in nice, proper, formal clothes, and it all has to be ready by sunset. Square, sweet locks and cuddle, yeah? Yes. OK. Thank you. With Shabbat, there's a real ah, sense of urgency, and everything feels quite mad in the run-up to it, because there's so many things you're not able to do. Like, the kids are tearing the toilet roll, because you can't tear the toilet roll. Mum's, like, cooking massive batches because she's not allowed to cook. Etel, is the lasagna ready? Dad's shouting at the kids, he's got the unks, they're not listening. Where are you going? Think home alone. You know when they're running about before they're going to miss the flight? It's that kind of vibe. You saw it, can you put your laundry away, please? When the sun sets, you have to make sure that everything's in order. Otherwise, you're you're stuck for 25 hours. Before we start, we're just going to blow the show for anyone that missed it this morning. Since coronavirus has kiboshed indoor gatherings, Mordecai has taken to use in the family garden for communal services while streaming it online. OK, page 170. <laughs> The key instruction of Shabbat is to cease working. So, to honour this rule, the crew and I have decided to down tools until sunset tomorrow. Have a lovely Shabbos, everyone. Take care. Shabbos. Travis, sir. It's Saturday, and there's only a few more hours left, and then we're able to start filming again with the family. Shabbat will be over. Do you think you'd be able to do it, Stacey? I wouldn't last five minutes. I would not 
last five minutes. I'm addicted to my phone, which isn't a good trait. I think it requires an untold amount of dedication and I mean, to do it every week as well. As the sun drops, marking the end of Shabbat, I head back to the house. On arrival, we notice a group of youths shouting at the family from across the street. What did they say? I didn't catch it. The kid said stupid Jews or something like that. That's not OK. Like, I, and you just completely ignored it. And that's where you're a lot more mature than me, because I'd have been tempted to bite back. And the fact that your kids have to listen to that is mad. It doesn't happen on a daily basis. Um, we live in a pretty diverse neighbourhood, but I definitely have colleagues who, on a regular basis, are accosted on their way to shore, and it's unfortunate. Um, thank God it's a relatively rare occurrence. I'm sorry, yeah. Um, I'm sorry that's just happened. That's really yeah. rubbish. I, d I do find things like that upsetting because I just... It, f it feels so unkind, unnecessarily unkind. You know what I mean? They're still outside their own house, doing absolutely nothing. Me as a white woman, I think we sort of live in this diverse bubble, and I think, you know, oh, London's great, and we've got it right in so many ways, but clearly there's still so much to, to do. I'm privileged to be staying with a strict Orthodox Jewish family, experiencing their ancient traditions. My Hebrew skills are being tested to the max. So you can just play the piece. So then you can say Baruch. Baruch. Ata. Ata. Adonai. Adonai. Hemi. Melech. Melech. Hamotzi. 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 Lechem. Lechem. Min. Min. Haorat. Haorat. Amen. 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 Congratulations. Whoa. Cheers. With the Jewish New Year approaching... Right, here we need to go. The evening ceremonies have only just begun. I am en route to observe one of the nighttime prayers. Basically, we're quite lucky to see this because this happens the week before Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, on the Saturday. Here, I'll be able to see, you know, the wider community, won't I? Mordecai serves some 800 Jewish families in North London. Since the pandemic, he has been faced with finding new ways of keeping them connected safely. Yeah, we're starting 11 with speeches, so all the rabbis are basically going to stand around. In the back there, that's where they're filming. It feels like it's drive-in movie night. Mordecai, talk me through what is going on. Right, so we've got our large screen here. Yeah. We're about to start our proceedings. In Jewish fashion, it's, it's late, um, which is a cultural thing. Um, we're going to start with a few speeches. Uh, we're going to have the chief rabbi on video. I'm going to say a few words. And then in about half an hour, we'll have the actual service while everyone else will be in their cars, basically. Um, so it's going to be a little bit strange, because normally it would be a bigger service. Um, but, you know, that's evolution for you. How do I turn my headphones no on? No clue. Oh, look at this. This is like a silent disco. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's very strange speaking to a load of cameras with no people around, but something we've got used to in the last few months. I know there's a lot of you out there in your cars, some of you watching at home as well, and it's really wonderful. I'm impressed with Mordecai's resourcefulness, testament perhaps to a willingness to adapt in the face of adversity. A happy and a sweet new year, and particularly, of course, this year, good health for all of us. Thank you. Do you know what I think is really cool? They're like totally like unapologetically themselves even the teenagers i mean if you, if you saw me it's a there's no way i would have been so kind of connected to the to the family on a saturday night i was probably in the park 
smoking some roll up showing off, you know? To grow up in a strictly orthodox Jewish family could mean your destiny has largely been decided. You're expected to work, socialize and marry within the community and much of your spare time will be given to religious observance. I'm curious how Yisrolik deals with it all. I mean, your parents, they take their religion like super seriously, but I think they're quite relaxed with you guys. I, I don't think so. Really? I think my parents do, are, are quite strict, especially compared to people I know. It's not a bad thing, but it could be annoying. Yeah, parents are annoying, though. <laughs> do you worry that when you're further into your teens, you'll find it difficult to balance being an honourable Jewish man and allowing yourself to sort of explore life and do your own thing and find your own way? Mm. No, I don't, I don't think so. Um, I think it's really easy to, like, keep your Jewish identity, even if you're, yeah, if you're trying to explore and stuff, explore life. Have you ever had any doubts? Um, questions? I've, I've had a lot of questions, but not really, I haven't really doubted. There are some commandments which there's no reason for. So they are very strange, but it's, it's a step, like, be, for being faithful. That's, it's like a test. This religious framework that you have, is it, is it quite comforting? In some ways, yes. So you have, you have, like, some Jewish circles where you know people around the world because they're Jewish. Mm. In Judaism, we have, like, rabbis who would be um, the leader of a community in America, and we would be friendly with them because, yeah. just because they're rabbis and they do the same thing, so. So the fact that you share a religion, yeah. instantly there's a bond. Bring, yeah. yeah, it brings us all together. I've been thinking about what I'd find testing growing up in this culture. Both sexes are expected to dress with modesty, but the girls have to take things a little further. Why is it that only you and your husband can, can see your hair? I would say that's one of the faith belief things. That's a modesty thing. Although, if you go into it, hair is an attractive thing. The hair is something that obviously men find attractive, and it's so it's meant to be reserved for your husband. Have your kids ever seen your real hair? Um, no, I don't think so. So if you look carefully, she's got split ends, like hair would. You just trim that there. So, but don't say that. Hairdressers who don't deal with wigs won't touch a wig. Oh, really? Yeah, because with hair, if you mess it up, it'll grow back. With this, it won't grow back. And that would be, for this one, um, an $800 mistake. That's $800? 18 years ago. <laughs> nice that you've got a couple of styles to choose from, right? So you can yeah. sort of mix it up. So I like, I have one that I wear during the week, one that I like to wear on Shabbos, and one that can be whatever I want it to be. What age were you when you started wearing the wigs, and when will Etel and Diddles have to start? So you only hair? need to once you're married, because it's for a married Jewish woman. So. The age depends on when they get married. Strictly orthodox girls tend to marry in their early 20s. But as I've learned, enjoying affection with your other half isn't without its hurdles. According to the Torah, menstruate and women are considered impure. Lima has brought me to a mikvah, where women can cleanse themselves. I'm right in thinking every month, um, the lady has to visit the, so the bath. A, a married lady, a lady before she's married, 
and married ladies from after five days of menstruation and then seven clean days, so it's 12 days in total, and then she comes to the mikvah. And in those 12 days, there's no intimacy. Do you worry that it kind of gives younger girls the impression that you should sort of be embarrassed of periods and it's quite shameful and you've got to go in the night and it's all quite hush-hush? No. It's, it's private, it's not secret. So it's not taboo, it's a private thing. And that's why it's kept quiet. Why does it have to be so private if it's so natural? Modesty isn't just the way we dress. Mm -hmm. It's the way we talk, it's the way we behave, it's the, you know, the way we deal with ourselves. So this is a private thing. Not everybody has to know when you and your husband are together. And it's, it's something that's just between the two of you. So it's not that it's a secret or that it's taboo. It's, it's purely that it's modest. Obviously, I've never experienced, you know, the immersion, the experience. Talk me through, sort of try and describe it to me. So some of the ladies have described it to me as a hug from God because the water's warm and it envelops them and they're going totally under it. There was one woman that I took once years ago who had a very, very challenging pregnancy and she went in her ninth month and she came out. Sorry, I get, I get emotional every time I think about it. And she came out and she said, I feel ready to have the baby now. She said, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> She said that was, that was just what I needed. Clearly, Belima is completely invested. There's no part of her, I don't get the impression there's any part of her that has ever wavered. The Torah, you know, she understands that this book is to be completely respected and she has to adhere to certain things, things that she doesn't understand. I wonder where that, that kind of unwavering dedication comes from. Beth, you need to get up in 10 minutes, OK? You start looking you up by any chance. It's my last day with the Wallenberg family, and I'm up at 6 a.m. to attend synagogue. It's time for Modest Stacy. How do you like my dress? It's perfect, isn't it? It's early. I've basically realised that nobody in this family sleeps for very long because they're all so dedicated. Morning. How are you? Good. How do you Looking like my dress? Suitable, very suitable, maybe. <laughs> and we better get going. Yep. Or, um, or we're going to be late. You um, cannot be late. You're the boss. Uh, keep up the whole busy, you know. Busy rabbi. Up image, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's, good. it's good for the image. I'm curious about the challenges of preaching such ancient traditions to a largely mainstream community. Apologies in advance. It's going to be very male-dominated. What can feel outdated to some is the segregation of women. Um, the actual ladies' section is at the back. OK. How do you feel about the fact that men and women have to be separated? Why is it important? Uh, I think so you can concentrate on your prayers more. We've, I've just grown up with it, and it's, it's what we do. Yeah, I know it's not everybody's cup of tea, but it's, it's, it's fine, and you're mainly focusing on your prayers. It's the thought process that men will be distracted by the women. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you all for your cooperation, and have a lovely day. As a rabbi in an ever-changing modern society, I'm guessing Mordecai has his work cut out. Thank you so much for allowing me in. Pleasure. It's very Hope interesting you yourself. for me to watch. This room normally takes 500 people. At the moment, we're looking at 80 people. As you saw, we don't get 500 every morning. We definitely had more men than women. So is that usual? There is the time. I can definitely see how it's quite patriarchal in that the men tend to go to the shawl more. And, um, at the moment, the division is right at the back, which is always unfortunate because the women are at the back. Um, in my ideal shawl, it would be right down the middle and everybody would be either side. That would be There's great. There's no Left reason right. that has to be at the back. 
The, the funny thing is, people are very traditional. So when we've tried that, they're like, oh, I don't like it. I like to be at the back. Um, by the standards of most Orthodox synagogues, we're doing more. There's a line in the morning prayer that essentially says, um, thank you for not making me a woman. Yes, this is a source of great controversy. Um, because that, that, that's so, yes, sort of borderline it, uh, offensive, It does sound it? a bit offensive. It's not supposed to be insulting. Is it outdated for 2020? It's only one blessing out of a whole canon of, I mean, there are many other places where we praise um, women over men. So I think it's, you know, if somebody wants to take that and make an issue out of it, they will. I appreciate it must be difficult for you to want to be deeply religious and adhere to traditions yeah. and respect people who are living in a very different way. In the sort of traditional world that I inhabit, where I'm the most observant person, it is a huge minefield of religious tradition which is very clear about what marriage and what family is versus the reality of how people are living their lives and that we want to be there for people so all these kind of issues gender issues male and female roles lgbtq plus whatever letters are currently there or if somebody is going through a gender transformation or whatever it's very challenging and somebody said to me i think that the greatest challenge of the next generation will be how orthodox judaism deals with the modern family if you like um, because you can't ignore the reality I really respect Mordecai. I just think he's trying to be like a tolerant human, first and foremost, but also a decent leader. They want to be deeply religious and they want to follow their laws sort of word for word, but they also accept that they do have to practice tolerance and they do have to practice acceptance. And, you know, we live in a progressive liberal society. And he's saying to me, Stacey, ask me whatever you want. And often, you know, when you're talking about subjects that can be contentious, you know, there's little disclaimers or, or let's not talk about this or oh, I prefer we didn't go there. And I just really rate that. As an atheist, it's hard for me to comprehend the commitment to such a strict religion. I'm intrigued what drives their unfaltering sense of duty. This, this way of life seems all-encompassing. Tell me why it's so important to you to maintain your Jewish identity. In one Thinking word, continuity. Yeah, continuity. Continuity, um, it's not just a way of life, it's a heritage that was passed down from thousands of years ago and that is basically our responsibility to pass down to our children. We've been charged with something that we have to pass on to the next generation that the previous generation, often at great personal cost, preserved for us and now it's our job to preserve it for the next generation. Is that why you've decided to have so many children because you want the, the Jewish way of life to continue. Definitely having a large family is obviously a good way to keep the traditions going. Um, I think there's definitely also a sense for a lot of people that overpopulation is not a problem for the Jewish community. Um, we lost six million people in the Holocaust. Um, our numbers have not increased dramatically since then. I think there's about like 20 million Jewish people in the world. So there is a sense of that probably that, you know, Overpopulation is not our problem. If anything, it's been the opposite, that we lost a lot of people, you know. You, you mentioned um, the Holocaust. Obviously, it's very well documented. How much do you go into that with the kids? And, and, and are you mindful of that in 2020? There's the tra traumatic side of it. Obviously, not everything is age appropriate. Um, I think also I have to choose my words really carefully here. Um, for some people, it's become a very large part of their Jewish identity. Now, I understand totally if your parents were survivors and you grew up in the shadow of the Holocaust, or the Shoah, as people call it, that that's going to be very big for you. But I don't think it's a healthy message to give your kids. You, we have to be Jewish because people are always killing us and persecuting us, and therefore, you know, someone's got to replace the people that were killed and persecuted, otherwise you're insulting their memory. Is that a really positive identity? Yeah. yeah. Um, so and someone I, I once asked me about it, and I, the way I explained it was, we need to remember it so that it doesn't happen again. 
you know, I mean, you can see the anti-Semitism mm -hmm. that is still around. Yes, the other night we were in your car park outside your yeah. home and you've got ignorant people shouting nonsense. And it's my like grandparents it's... fought for this country. It, yeah, I sometimes it's... feel like shout, grabbing these guys by the scruff of the neck and saying, my grandpa didn't fight for you so mm. that you could insult his mm. grandchildren in the street. You know? yeah. but I get the impression most of the people yelling in the street is probably just because you look different and they can't handle that. I would absolutely have you and your family around my home. I would love to. But it would just be a given that you, you can't eat in my house because it's not the kitchen ain't kosher at all. Make you could just tense. come round, but I couldn't right. make you any food. Yeah. I could show you my new, my new table that I won't stop, like, won't stop talking about. I only swore. I haven't sworn in this house the whole time. I'm very proud. <laughs> my mouth's like good. a sewer, Mordecai. I know I watched your videos. <laughs> <laughs> It's my last evening and I feel like I've learnt a lot. And mostly without putting my foot in it. It's our last supper, Mordecai. Yes, well, wrong religion, but yes. Our last dinner. How's the weekend been for you? Well, obviously you're far too polite to ever be rude to guests, but seriously speaking, first of all, it's been great having guests full stop because we haven't had guests for a while. Secondly, it's been really lovely. It's always nice to talk uh, about how lovely our family are. And it's always nice to talk about our religion and. Thank you for asking lots of interesting questions, and I hope it's been uh, educational. It, it's been an eye-opener for me. I know that sounds funny, because you're learning about our lives, but it has, because so, so much is like, we just do it, and we don't think about it. No regrets? No. Are you going to miss me? Yeah. Oh, mate. <laughs> Are you going to miss me, Mendel? Yeah? We enjoyed having you, so, uh, yeah. Please come again. Back. Yay! That's always what I'm after. If you ever wanted to, you're very welcome to. Um, might be a problem with the mixed dancing and the Strictly. I don't know if anyone... <laughs> Some of them outfits were not that, modest. Yeah. <laughs> so, do you want to start? Or... Yeah, okay. So, so you can clockwise. Okay, you can put down anything green or full. I think, you know, they're just lovely kids and they're a really sweet family. There's a really no loving atmosphere. I will miss them. I've just walked past all the kids now with their mum, sat on the stairs, singing. They can't stop giggling, and it's like idyllic. You are going to have nine children then. I don't think I'm going to have nine children. I've left it too late for nine. <laughs> Thank you so, so much for being so great. No worries. I hope you've enjoyed it. Definitely. Lots and lots and lots. <laughs> right, lots of love. Thank you so much. You going to wave, bye. Gabby? Bye-bye. Hey, bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Let's go. You want to close the door? Yeah, here we go.